It's Dr. Anthony Cave. Uh, shout out is going to go to Courtney, Chris, and Matt for being the first in here to comment. I hope you're all doing well and you're all ready for this really important topic that you wanted me to specifically share. And we'll get started. I hope that the audio is better this time than then the last live stream. Shout out again to Courtney, Chris, and Matt. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And some of the most determined and tenacious patients that I've ever cared for have what's called chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis, MECFS. And it's also called soldier's heart because I have so many patients that were once high functioning in whether tech, I'm in the Bay Area after all, right in San Francisco, or athletes, or any number of truly exceptional high functioning people who after a certain trigger have developed this condition and they want so badly to be their former selves, to overcome, they are not lazy, they are not bored, they're not just confused and depressed. They want so badly. Guys, it's why we call this soldier's heart. They want to get better, but they can't. It's one of medicine's most mysterious conditions that we've known about for centuries. Yet most doctors don't feel comfortable diagnosing it. Most patients not only go undiagnosed for years, maybe decades, but worst of all, they don't know that they are in a community of millions of others around the world. And that makes their loneliness and isolation so much worse. And that isolation and loneliness makes their condition sometimes unfathomably challenging. And that's what I hope you will all learn today, not only about what MECFS is, but also why loneliness affects these vulnerable individuals more than maybe you and me, and we all are already incredibly vulnerable to loneliness. So, uh, KM, I am absolutely believing in you, and thank you for sharing that. Please take what you learned today, and I'm, you're gonna have some concrete steps that you're going to share with others, especially someone who you feel might be challenged with loneliness, and especially if they have chronic fatigue syndrome, because of it or contributing to it. So as always, this is live and unscripted. I'm here in a live operating room where I was treating patients not too long ago. And this starts with a patient who has had CFS before, who before their surgery, I've shared this story before, they told me that they didn't know what to look forward to because of their intense social isolation. We know that loneliness takes away our ability to have meaning and purpose in life. And we know that not having meaning and purpose in life makes us less likely to be engaged with our health, health care, whether that's surgery or whether it's healing from MECFS. So that individual ended up having a challenging surgical course and surgery recovery course. And the same thing happens to MECFS patients even outside of the operating room. And specifically, I'm gonna share some of the science and also how surgery and anesthesia reflect just how serious the loneliness connection is with them and what you'll be able to take away. So first and foremost, there are many things that we believe can cause MECFS. We don't know all of them, but it appears that perhaps certain infections can trigger this, maybe heavy metal poisoning, maybe mold, maybe certain allergies. We don't know, but it appears that something changes someone's biology to help deplete their energy production capabilities. And it's not about being lazy because if you give patients with MECFS stimulants, methylphenidate, modafinil, etc., they won't get more energy. And this is very profound because we're in the operating room. I give medications to patients, at least <laughs> semi-regularly to help then have a more hyperactive nervous system, either to wake up from surgery or anesthesia. These medications don't help patients with MECMS, MECFS have more energy because their ATP production, ATP is one of the molecules in the body that is like the energy currency. It 
provides energy to your whole body. It's a molecule that you burn for fuel. They don't appear to produce ATP the way that you and I do because of complications from a major trigger, like I had mentioned. Infection, maybe heavy metal poisoning or some other poisoning, etc. The classic symptoms, which don't always apply to everyone, however, you have to recognize just how varied they are. They include every major organ system effectively. Your brain, brainstem and spinal cord, that manifests as brain fog, as what appears to be cognitive uh, impairment or dementia, forgetfulness, etc. It affects your heart in what we see as autonomic neuropathy, so like racing heart or too heart, too slow of a heart rate, blood pressure swings that are not um, appropriate. And thank you, Donna, for that super thanks. I greatly appreciate that. Your immune system is heavily affected, whether it is an autoimmune condition, meaning your immune condition is attacking your central nervous system is still up for debate, but certainly individuals that are suffering with ME-CFS appear to have a greater propensity to developing infectious uh, infections like common colds, etc. They may have a higher chance of having a severe reaction to those infections. And then lastly, the metabolic part. So there's every cell in your body has what are called mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Patty Hoffman, thank you as well for your kind thank you. That's very, very kind of you. And the mitochondria produce energy, but like someone here, I, and I forget your name, I apologize, you said the Krebs cycle is, appears to be disrupted because the mitochondria are not able to properly produce ATP. And more in, importantly, it affects our ability to rest in times that we would ordinarily replenish our energy reserves. So the classic thing that patients tell me, classic, is like, Doc, I go to sleep, but I wake up not refreshed. So when they come into the operating room with me, they love the white medication because they're like, Doc, that's the only rest I can ever get. I'm not saying that you should ever use this if you have chronic fatigue syndrome or uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, but <laughs> Recognizing that there is intense sleep disruption, it's part of the brain issue and spinal cord issue. Um, also the pain that contributes to them not being able to sleep. And as you can imagine, medications like this that I regularly use in surgery, this is fentanyl, this one also produces a significant relief from pain that they might be feeling. Once again, absolutely not appropriate to use for that purpose, but in surgery, it's a vulnerable time where there is a need for these medications and we need to be observant of the effects that it has in this population that may never be having their needs addressed because nobody knows about them. And doctors aren't even comfortable talking about it. And just so you know, it is very true that even in medical school, most medical students are taught something along the lines of, maybe this is in their head. Yes, of course it is in their head and in their spinal cord and in their heart and in their bloodstream. Yes, it is, but it's a little perhaps not reflective of a true patient's life to say that it's, quote, just in their head with that pejorative nuance. That's simply not true, but we still grow up learning these things. I learned this. I heard many of my attending physicians when I was a medical student refer to CFS that way. Simply not true. So you have to recognize that many post-viral conditions can have similar symptoms to ME-CFS. But the big difference here, and this is what I want everyone to take away today, please. You can have long COVID. You can have chronic Lyme. You can have mononucleosis from an Epstein-Barr virus infection. You can have complications from Giardia and West Nile virus that can have similar symptoms. You can have SICU syndrome, which is when the physical trauma of being in the intensive care unit has this similar blowout of your ATP production. But what nobody acknowledges in all of these disease processes 
is that while there is an infectious trauma to your body in those cases, or a physical trauma in the case of surgery in ICU, there is a psychological, perhaps a spiritual trauma, if you subscribe to that belief, I personally do, to an extent, that is not addressed if we don't address the loneliness. Here is why loneliness matters more than perhaps anything else, because we don't have any medications. Thank you, Dave, for that super thanks. Very kind of you. We don't have any medications that are approved for ME-CFS. We have various supplements that may or may not be helpful. But if we don't address somebody's isolation from their doctors who might not acknowledge their disease or even know about it, if we don't acknowledge how their neighbors don't even know that they live there anymore because they can't even leave the house, if their family thinks that, oh, they're just in bed all day and they're tired, they don't want to see us, if their friends have given up on them because they don't understand what's going on, if the patient themselves, and please recognize that if the patient themselves don't know that what they're experiencing is true, they're not, I mean, if they're being gaslit, how can they expect to ever reach a healing place, to be able to tap into their inner healing potential to allow other therapeutics to work? And when you're under anesthesia, you've heard from me before how anxiety, depression, PTSD, you can't, you, we don't have tests to prove those in patients, just like how we don't have tests to prove ME-CFS in patients yet. We likely will, we don't have any yet. But how many billions of dollars go towards those conditions? How many commercials do you see in the United States in particular for Zoloft? for Cymbalta, for et cetera, et cetera, versus any awareness whatsoever of ME-CFS. It's not like ME-CFS is any less real than anxiety or depression. Under anesthesia, you've heard how I share what happens to patients. And we'll talk about anesthesia and ME-CFS in a minute as well. But there is no money because people don't acknowledge it. And if people are unacknowledged, they're going to be isolated. If they're isolated, that contributes to kinesiophobia, pessimism, and <laughs> I'm sorry, but <clears throat> excuse me, the catastrophization or the catastrophizing that will make every one of those organ systems function worse. The brain, the immune system, heart and lungs, etc. So <clears throat> recognize that loneliness affects 50% of all comers in the United States. And if you have ME-CFS, you're more likely to also be lonely for all those reasons. Social media helps make it worse, obviously. And loneliness alone increases the risk of premature mortality more than 15 cigarettes a day. We know this. So when you add loneliness to ME-CFS, what do you think that's going to do to patients who are experiencing ME-CFS? Right? Every single condition is going to be made worse. The autonomic neuropathy, potentially worse. The risks of diabetes complications, worse. Strokes, heart attacks, macrovascular and microvascular complications from diabetes, worse. Of course, risk for anxiety and depression. And how about suicide? We know that loneliness is one of the worst predictors in terms of, I'm sorry, like, <laughs> one of the worst risk factors to have for suicide. And when you already have ME-CFS, we don't even acknowledge that the loneliness component, you will read about all the different organ systems I told you about, but nobody acknowledges the one thing that we can do something about. And that is addressing our loneliness. And how do we do that? With compassion from your doctors. Your doctors should know about this condition, and if they don't, please educate them in it. There are so many foundations out there that can do so. It is really unforgivable in the 21st century for doctors to not be acknowledging. Presence and social connection are clearly important. Uh, that's what we talk about on this channel. I'm not gonna go into it more right now because we still have to talk about the anesthesia portion because anesthesia demonstrate something very important for this patient population that no other population, I think, struggles with. And that's that you can't get the empathy and presence that I mentioned if people are too busy 
trying to push an agenda on you. And there are many special interest websites. All you have to do is do a Google search for MECFS, and I did a couple before this live stream to really see what it's like out there. And I was shocked to see how much misinformation there was. This, this, this misinformation is, is pretty drastic because I saw it specifically for surgery and anesthesia. You know, I, like I said, I'm in an operating room, ventilator, like all the medications. And when I have patients here, there's a message that disempowers them, that everyone with MECFS should recognize. And even if you don't have MECFS, you should recognize. It is that there is a hyper focus on medications you can't give these patients because patients are so sensitive to anesthetics, sensitive to histamine releasing agents, which means they say you shouldn't use nearly half the medications that we ordinarily use. Curare, muscle relaxing agents, epinephrine, lidocaine, etc. This is something that can hijack a patient's mind because they enter the operating room with me thinking, doctor, I can't get, and they give me a big laundry list of medications. What happens to their concept of isolation when they think, oh my gosh, I can't get anesthesia like every other patient because I have MECFS. I am gonna have like a rougher surgery course because of my MECFS. You know, it appears that there are no good studies to show that these patients have anesthesia affect them differently. Yes, there are some differences from the anxiety, depression, PTSD that we talk about regularly, but, but the concerns that these websites put in my patients' minds, like I said, hijack their central nervous system to wind them up, to increase their fear in ways that hurt them more. Because when they wake up, they tend to have more complications after surgery and anesthesia. Worse nausea, greater need for pain control, a harder time waking up. My point is that we should be focusing on social connection in patients, especially with MECFS before surgery, instead of scaring them and oftentimes scaring their doctor to further alienate that patient physician connection before the vulnerable period of surgery. So for example, instead of like, oh, you can't get these medications because maybe somebody anecdotally had a bad reaction, not saying it's not true, but to date, nothing has consistently been proven. How about we have a conversation of who's gonna be taking care of you at home? Who's gonna be cooking you nutritious, delicious meals at home after? Who's gonna drive you to the park to help you recover in nature? Who's going to be there with you in case you need help? Who's gonna be there to help pick up your medications in the pharmacy? None of my patients come to me with having had this discussion before the operating room and that is what breaks my heart. Because they'll tell me everything that I should or shouldn't do as an anesthesiologist. Some of it might be accurate, by and large it's not. And nobody focuses on the thing that might be singularly most important to advocate for any patient, but especially MECFS. And that's why I hope that, like I said at the beginning, pessimism, kinesiophobia, and catastrophizing these aren't addressed, these will torpedo anesthesia and surgery, but addressing these doesn't require any medications or any of these websites that I'm referring to that give laundry lists that appear to scare patients more than empower them. I hope that you recognize that when we demystify any condition such as MECFS, we can allow more patients to find their true diagnosis. The more patients have their true diagnosis, the more they can support each other so that they feel an affinity towards others. They don't feel as disempowered or as isolated or as alienated from society. And that is what I hope that you take away today and you share with others. Don't pretend like your neighbor doesn't exist. Perhaps ask them how they're doing. Maybe they're suffering from MECFS or another condition where that simple act of compassion and empathy might make a far bigger difference than any prescription medication or any surgery.